Well, again, I'm glad you're here today. We're going to continue our series called Marvel, and we're going to hear from Pastor Dallas. Come on, somebody. I just want you to know that Pastor Dallas, he, he has an anointing on him. He does. And, and he was God-ordained to come to this church. He heard God. We heard God. And, and, and he's growing his anointing. And so I just felt the Lord just impress upon my heart. When, you, when you're listening to him, you're not listening to a youth pastor. You're listening to a man of God. Okay, you're not listening to a worship pastor, and he does both of those things, but you're listening to a man of God. And so I want you to lean in, because he's got a word today. I know that it, will, it can transform your life. Reach your hands out to Pastor Dallas. Father, in Jesus' name, I just thank you for Pastor Dallas today. I thank you for a special anointing on his life. May this be a day where the anointing flows like it's never done before. We thank you for it. We receive your word through him today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 1 Corinthians 14.33 says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. God does not author confusion. We live in a pretty confusing time, though, don't we? I was seated with a few people just the other day and just talking about things that are happening in our culture and things around us, having a conversation that wouldn't even have been thought of, that people argue about things now that weren't even in our mind 10 years ago. The very fact that children don't even know what gender they are. Pretty confusing, right? Sexuality, politics, news outlets, the internet and social media coming to rise and so many voices, so many voices, so many opinions, all filling the airwaves. And that has caused a very confusing world that we live in, almost as if like a cloud has settled over our nation. Like people are having a hard time discerning what's true and what's false anymore. And I want to tell you that it's definitely in our world, but what's disturbing is that it has bled into the church. It's bled into places where things that were sure, things that were sure foundations are now being questioned. And I believe that God wants to come into his church and rid confusion with clear and uncompromised truth. Because if it's foggy in the church, it's darkness in the world. See, the scripture says, not that Jesus was just the light of the world, but by Jesus' own admission, he said, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. And can I tell you that if it didn't say that we are the light of the church, hear it. It said we're the light of the world. So what does that mean? If the world is dark, then the church has ceased to shine. The word says that his word is a light to us. It's a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. His word is a light and a lamp. But it seems that his word has been compromised and diluted so that the light doesn't shine anymore, that it's gotten dark in the church, and it's gotten even darker in the world. And I want to tell you that we got to do something about it. So today I want to talk a little about the cause of that and about how to overcome it. And what we're going to do is look at a man named Micaiah. Everybody say Micaiah. See, this is a, a man in the Old Testament. It's one of those stories that can be overlooked, but I'm telling you, it's a doozy. <laughs> it's a fun one to read. And I read this a little while ago, and the Lord had been, it just been resting on me, and I felt impressed to bring it today. And I want to tell you that Micaiah was a contender, all right? A contender. Jude 3 says, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting to you to contend earnestly for the faith. Say the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Can I tell you, truth does not evolve. The faith was once and for all delivered. Once. 
that God's faith and his truth was delivered through Jesus Christ, his blood, and his apostles. And it has been delivered to us through his word, and he doesn't change, and his word doesn't change. Once and for all. But we live in a culture that feels like his truth is evolving. Oh, well, of course, Jesus would accommodate the world around him by compromising his truth. That's my type of Jesus. That's my truth. I want to tell you that God is looking for contenders. See, the word contend is a Greek word. And I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but you can put it up there. (laughs) If anybody can pronounce that, I'll give you $5 afterwards, all right? (laughs) To struggle or fight for. This word actually is the root word that we get the word agonize. See, he says, contend. See, and Jude said, I wanted to write you a nice letter today. I wanted to really encourage you, but I can't because I'm scared that what God delivered is being polluted. And I'm telling you, I feel the same burden today. I feel that what God has delivered is being polluted progressively. But we need contenders. People who will fight for the truth. People who will earnestly stand for the truth. And people who will agonize over it. What does that mean? It means that when something is said that's not true, it bothers you. We walk around and stuff is said that's not true all the time, and yet we just continue going. It should bother you. I'm telling you by God's admission as a contender, when the truth is not represented, it should bother the church. It should bother us because it's truth that sets people free. I want to tell you that, would you guys, have you heard me preach before? Who's here heard me preach? Would you say I'm a nice guy? <laughs> I'm a nice guy, right? I want you to remember that today, <laughs> okay? Because I might say some things today that might try to say otherwise, but here's what I want to say right at the outset. We've been set free, and I'm so concerned about your freedom that I'm willing to say some things that'll step on your toes. Because Jesus set us free, and yet we're back in bondage. And I want to tell you it's the truth. And sometimes it's the most offensive truth that is the most politically incorrect. And the enemy wants to silence that truth because he knows that people won't get free unless it gets spoken. So if you would today, I want to just speak God's word. I want to tell the truth because I believe in the power of God's word. And that's what Micaiah did. Micaiah spoke the truth in front of a king, kings and people who did not want to hear it. He spoke the truth even though it got him into trouble. <laughs> and the name of this message, who remembers like, I want to be like Mike commercial, commercials, Michael Jordan. Today is called Be Like Mike. Kaya. <laughs> <laughs> we want to be like my Kaya. <laughs> we want to look at him and we want to see that, that uncompromised fervor that he had, that he knew he had heard from God and therefore he was uncompromised and he was unafraid of the mob and the kings and all the politics around him and he spoke God's truth and God confirmed it. So I want to be like Mike, amen? Amen. So, Heavenly Father, I just ask that you let everybody know that what I'm saying today is right. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Father, we love you. We trust you. Your word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. Let us not compromise the very truth that would set us free. God, I pray by your Holy Spirit that you would come and that you would cause, Lord, your word to come alive in our hearts. Jesus, you were filled with grace and truth. Let this word be filled with grace and truth. And I pray that people would not hear from a man today, but they would hear from you, from you, that they would get a fresh word in Jesus' mighty name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, if you're tracking with me today, I got a a story out of 1 Kings 22, and I want to set it up before we jump in. 
It starts with two kings meeting together, King Ahab and King Jehoshaphat. King Ahab was an evil king. You ever hear Jezebel? Ooh, Jezebel. He was married to Jezebel. And Jehoshaphat was a good king. Who remembers the story where the king calls the worshipers out and the worshipers go to battle first and then they won the victory because the worshipers went out? Anybody know that story in the Bible? Pretty cool story, right? That was Jehoshaphat. It's amazing. But here's what happened. They joined together because King Ahab was king of the northern kingdom and Jehoshaphat was king of the southern kingdom, which was Judah. And they decided to meet together because Ahab wanted to go to war. And he said, why don't we join together? <laughs> the first mistake, but I won't preach on that today, okay? We're going to go at, but he, he joined with them. Jehoshaphat joined with them and said, are we not the same people? Your people, my people, you're Israel, I'm Israel. And I want to tell you that not all of Israel was Israel before God's eyes. And not all the church is God's church before his eyes. So I'm just saying we're going to touch some of those things today. So they join together and they decide that they're going to go out and fight these people. But Jehoshaphat, the good king, he decided to say something. Here's what he said. He said, okay, I'm with you, but can we have a prophet come first? Because that's, that's a good thing to do. Can we hear from the Lord first? Ahab's like, of course, I do that every time. <laughs> sure he does. And he calls forth 400 of his own prophets. And those prophets go, oh, mighty king, you're so great, Ahab. You're the best. You and Jezebel are amazing, you know, and your paycheck's great too. And they say, Lord, go into battle and you're going to win. You're going to win. And something set with Jehoshaphat. He sat there going, is there somebody else who could talk? He did. He goes, is there yet another prophet in the land? And then Ahab said this, well, there's one, but I hate him. Because he never says anything nice about me. He always speaks trouble. And Jehoshaphat says, a king shouldn't talk like that. We need to go get him. Yeah. Amen. Jehoshaphat was a good leader. And you see some of that coming out. Luke 20, or 6, 26 says, Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you. For that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. That's Jesus speaking. George Orwell said, the further a society drifts from truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. He was hated for a good reason. So, we jump in the story, and I want to read from uh, 1 Kings 22, 10 through 29. And I want us to read, and I'm going to make some parallels to our culture along the way with this story. So track with me, starting at verse 10. It says, King Ahab of Israel and the King Jehoshaphat of Judah dressed in the royal robes. They were sitting on their thrones at the threshing floor near the gate of Samaria. All of Ahab's prophets, say Ahab's, were prophesying there in front of them. So this is the second time these prophets are before them. One of them, Zedekiah, son of Canaan, made some iron horns and proclaimed, This is what the Lord says. With these horns, we will gore the Arameans to death. All the other prophets agreed, saying, yes. They said, go up to Ramoth Gilead and be victorious, for the Lord will give the king victory. Hmm. See, this is another time. This is the second time where they call the prophets before them, and they're dressed in the royal robes, and all of these prophets are just speaking, go king, mighty king, y'all are going to win, y'all are going to take the land. And I want to tell you something, that these were puppet prophets. They were puppets. And I'm going to unpack that in a little bit. But here Micaiah comes on the scene, verse 13. Meanwhile, the messenger who went to get Micaiah said to him, Look, all the prophets are promising victory for the king, Micaiah. Be sure that you agree with them and that you promise success. <laughs> Puppet peer pressure. <laughs> but Micaiah replied, As surely as the Lord lives, I will only say what the Lord tells me to say. Hallelujah. We like Micaiah, right? Be like Mike. When Micaiah arrived before the king, Ahab asked him, Micaiah, should we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or should we hold back? I love this. Micaiah replied sarcastically, yes, almighty king. 
Oh, yes, go up, go up and be victorious. The Lord surely will give you victory. And then the king replied sharply, how many times must I tell you to tell the truth when you speak before the Lord? It makes me think, how many times has he done this? Micaiah comes and he has no respect for this king. He's like, you're, you're a joke. This whole thing's a joke. Sure, go up, you'll win. Are we done here? Okay. And here's what that king said. Didn't I tell you, Jehoshaphat? He never prophesies anything but trouble for me. Trying to discount him. But then Micaiah, Micaiah gets real and he says, okay, listen to what the Lord says. I saw the Lord seated on his throne with all the armies of heaven around him, on his right and his left hand. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab to go into battle against Ramoth Gilead so that he may be killed? There were many suggestions. And finally, a spirit approached the Lord and said, I can do it. How will you do it? The Lord asked. And the spirit replied, I will go out and I will inspire all his, the prophets of Ahab to speak lies. The Lord said, you will succeed. Go ahead and do it. And he said, so you see, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouths of all your prophets, for the Lord has pronounced your doom. Mm. Man, even scholars have a hard time with this text. And we're going to unpack it in a little bit. All right, we're going we're gonna to go at this. A delusion comes over them. But then it says, Zedekiah, the son of Canaanah, walked up to Micaiah and slapped him across the face and said, since when did the spirit of the Lord leave me to speak to you? He demanded. And Micaiah replied, you will find out soon enough when you are trying to hide in some secret room. <laughs> See, you know the word of the Lord because it doesn't come back void. Arrest him, the king of Israel ordered. And he said to take him back to the uh, his son's kingdom to not give him uh, anything except for keep him in prison with bread and water. And then Micaiah replied, if you return safely, it will mean that the Lord has not spoken through me. And he added, mark my words to every person there. See, I love Micaiah. And I want to tell you that our nation needs a Micaiah more than ever before. One who will speak even if it cost him something. One who will speak the truth even before authorities, dignitaries, mobs, peoples, every group that will stand for the Lord and speak his words. And I want to tell you today that I want to be like Mike and I want people to rise up. I want the church. I believe that the church should be a true mouthpiece for the Lord. When I say prophet, a lot of people want to discount themselves. I want to tell you that the church is meant to be the prophet of God in the earth. It's meant to speak forth the words of God. Every one of you are a prophet in that sense. You are called to represent the Lord and speak his words. Can I get an amen? So I want to say to be like Mike today, we have to do three things. We have to settle it, we have to love it, and we have to speak it. These things are the truth of God's word. The first point is settled that God's word is the truth. John 17, 17 said, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. This is Jesus speaking. Your word is truth. See, we live in a culture now where it's no longer the truth, it's your truth. What's your truth? Tell your truth. And it's built on people's experiences, their feelings, their opinions, their political correctness. And they call it their truth. And can I tell you that that type of truth has no, never set anybody free? Ever. We live in this place where people's truths are so elevated, everybody has a platform because of social media. And everybody wants to say something. And it causes confusion to sweep over the lamb, but that was not Micaiah. He didn't speak his truth. He spoke the Lord's truth, which is the truth, the uncompromised truth. I want to tell you that truth is absolute. It is beyond us. It is over us. We are not over it. We discover it. We don't get to just distort it. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The scripture says, let 
God be true and let all men be liars. But I tell you that there's puff, puppet prophets just like there were then now. And let me tell you what a puppet prophet does. They prophesy for the praise of man, public opinion, political gain, and a paycheck. They like pats on the back. They like to speak whatever is trending. They like to appease human authority while denying God's authority. And if you run really to it, you'll see that many times money is behind it. They are politically correct people pleasers in the pocket of man, government, and culture. How is that happening today? Show me that picture. Picture says a thousand words, right? Oh, don't get mad at me. Show me the next one. Public opinion. Man's thoughts. Man's opinions. Don't get anybody upset. Don't say anything that might ruffle somebody's feathers, that might hurt their feelings. It's okay for them not to enter into the kingdom of God, but don't hurt their feelings. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Why does the word of God say do not be deceived? Because people who get in these things fall into deception. They don't know what they're doing. You know, many people will say this is unloving. But I want to tell you, if I were to work at a place and I was overseeing a, a group of people who were suffering with blindness and their favorite activity just happened to be playing in the street, would it be unloving for me to say, you don't get to play in the street? Hello? It's goofy and it's simple, right? God's word is clear. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites will enter the kingdom of God. They will not have a part under God's rule, nor amidst God's people. Is it love not to say that? Is it love to be silent? No, it is not. I'm telling you that there are people today who say they represent God and they preach political correctness and the opinions of man rather than the word of God. And I'm telling you, it's causing confusion in the land. 2 Peter 3.16 says that these type of people twist the word of God to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. That word twist means pervert. They don't let God's word be the authority. They make themselves the authority, and they twist it to their own desires. Whatever suits them, as long as it doesn't hurt their feelings. I want to tell you that God's truth sets free when it is proclaimed. That's why I can say it in love, because these truths must be proclaimed so that people can be set free from that. And God's power is the same yesterday, today, and forever to set people free from fornication, from homosexuality, from pornography, from sexual addiction. He came to set the captive free. Not so you can live in it. Jesus' blood was not shed so you could play around in sin that he died to set you free from in the name of love. That is a lie from the pit of hell. If it cost Jesus his blood, then why do we play with it? Micaiah was not that type of prophet. He stood before the king not looking for his favor. He stood and spoke a truth that was very unpopular and did not get a pat on the back. He got put in prison. And so did the early church. So did the people who gave us the faith that we live today. And we need to contend again because it's being lost because we have a bunch of spineless Christians who are acting like they're in love and they're in fear. Oh, I'm going to tell the truth today. It's fear that causes these people to be silent. Not God's love. Because if you see blind people playing in the street and you pass by, that's not love. They will not inherit God's kingdom. And anybody who says that they're of the Lord and they preach that message is in a lie. 
I'm telling you to be like Micaiah, we have to settle it, that God's word is true. His word is the truth. I'm telling you, I believe the word of God. From the start to the finish, Genesis to Revelations, I believe the maps. I believe the word of God. We have to decide that God's word is true because in our day, things are being lost. Jesus said on this one, I will look. The word of God says, the one who is contrite and who trembles at my word. Trembles at my word. His word is not a suggestion. It is the authority. Jesus is the word of God made flesh. So we must settle it. And we must not only settle it, we must love it. We must love the truth. Blaise Pascal, a great Christian philosopher, said this, Truth is so obscure in these times and falsehood so established that unless we love the truth, we will not know it. There's that part in the story that I told you where he was standing in the council of the Lord, and the Lord said, who will, how, can I, how can I get Ahab to go to battle that he might be destroyed? And one says, I'll deceive all his prophets. I'll fill the mouth of all his prophets, so then he'll go to war, and then you, he'll, he'll die. See, a lot of people have a problem with that text. They go, they chalk it up to Old Testament, you know, New Testament. But I, I just want to, I want to show you something in the New Testament. Amen. After the blood of Jesus. We're in grace and truth. Amen. This is the New Testament. And this is what it says in 2 Thessalonians. And it sounds strangely familiar to that encounter that Micaiah said that he stood in the council of the Lord. 2 Thessalonians says, speaking of the enemy, he will come and he will use every evil deception to fool those on their way to destruction. Because they refuse to love, say love, and accept the truth that would save them. You see, it's not enough just to be casual. You have to love the truth. You have to love the truth, especially in a time that is confusing as ours. So God will cause them. Hear that? God will cause them to be greatly deceived, and they will believe these lies. Then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. When you love the truth, lies bother you. When people reject a love for the truth, the only thing left is to believe lies. And I want to tell you, we, we talk about loving people, and we do, and I do. And God said, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But a part of God is truth. It is as unchanging as he is. And if you're not loving the truth, you cannot love people. There's people who really love people. They get along with people, but they, they're not right vertically. And their love is irrelevant in getting people from here to there, from earth to heaven. I want to tell you that your love needs to love truth. You need to commit yourself, like Micaiah, to love truth. Because when you don't love truth, you are open to deception. Another translation of this says, because they did not love truth, God will cause a delusion to fall over them, and they will believe lies. I want to show you a picture of something that is the epitome of delusional, and this just happened like two weeks ago. Show me this next one. This is a, a news post line, and this is Madonna, you know, the queen of pop, and here's what she said. She tells Pope Francis that Jesus would be pro-choice, She said it clearly, because of course she would speak for God. Yeah, she thinks that way. So all the puppet prophets have a puppet God too, that they make in their own image, who says their opinions, and they say it is God's opinion. I want to tell you very clearly that these are not political truths today. Some people might be like, oh, this is political. No, no, it's not. These truths were written in God's word before there was ever an America. These truths will be in God's word when our nation is gone and the next eternity comes. His words are unchanging. 
Not one jot or tittle will be taken from them until heaven and earth passes away. Let me tell you what God's word says on this matter. Job 31, 15. Did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one fashion us in the womb? Psalm 139 says, he knew me and knit me together in my mother's womb. Jeremiah 1 says, before I was even born in my mother's womb, he knew me. He knew my days. God is the author of life, not confusion. God is the one who gives life. And I want to tell you that life is in the blood. Scripture says that life is is in the blood. And who remembers the story of Abel and Cain, where Cain killed his brother? And God goes to Cain and said, where's your brother, Cain? And he said, am I my brother's keeper? And God said, don't you know his righteous blood cries out to me from the ground? Can I tell you innocent blood cries to God? Abraham Lincoln said this. He said, during the Civil War, this is his assessment of the Civil War. He said, I want the war to be over. But he says, but if the blood that was shed by the lash must equal the blood drawn by the sword and bayonet, let it be said altogether that God's judgments are true and pure. If you didn't catch that, what he's saying is the civil war was God's judgment for the innocent slave blood that was shed and that God was requiring blood for blood. What if God were to require the blood of millions and millions of babies in one generation? Because that blood speaks to him. I'm telling you, because the church doesn't stand in the counsel of God, they don't say these things. But God hates abortion. And he sees it as murder. I'm telling you the truth. It is not political to him. It breaks his heart, who has a dream for people. And it's stifled and aborted out by the plans of man. On the altar of inconvenience and sexual immorality. With pop icons standing up and puppeting as if they speak for God. That is called a delusion. And those who listen to it are caught up in it. And they will receive the judgment of it. Do not be deceived. God hates abortion. He hates it. Settle it. Let God's word be true. And let confusion leave from the church's midst. My mother prayed a prayer over me when I was growing, and it was that I would desire truth in my inward parts. I didn't understand that prayer as I was growing up because I didn't follow the Lord for a while, but she would pray from Psalm 51 that I would desire truth in my inward parts, that the core of me would long for truth. And I'm telling you, you need to pray that prayer. Lord, let me desire truth in my inward parts. Let me love the truth that sets me free. Even if it hurts, God, let it set me free. Even if I have to go under the blade of your sword, let it cut out the cancer. Let it cut out the confusion. I want the truth because I want to be free from deception. And I tell you that today I don't stand as one who's a Republican or a Democrat or one who is black or white or Hispanic. I stand as a Christian who stands for righteousness and justice. Righteousness and justice for all. The last thing we need to do is speak the truth. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a man who was murdered He was murdered by people in the German army because he was a German pastor and he preached during that genocide of the Jews. And you know what he did? Rather than being in safety, he lived in New York. He went back to Germany and he proclaimed that what they were doing was wicked and he was killed for it. Here's what he said. Silence in the face of evil is evil itself. God will not hold us guiltless Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. Silence in the face of these evils are evil itself. I told you that Ahab was an evil king and that Jehoshaphat was a good king. You would think in Micaiah coming into this place that he would come in and he might have something to say to the good king. You know? 
Because he's obviously led, he's led people into battles and victories for the Lord. He led the worshipers out, but he didn't have anything to say to Jehoshaphat. He didn't encourage him, he didn't do anything, and he did not align himself with him. Instead, he came and he spoke for God to all of them, to the kings and the puppet prophets alike. And he was not seeking to align himself with the politics of the people. Can I tell you that the politics of this nation have silenced the church? People say, well, that's, you know, religion and politics. You don't talk about those things. Where's that in the Word of God? That is an assignment from the enemy to keep people from being free. And I want to tell you that Jehoshaphat, I mean, Micaiah stood in the counsel of the Lord and received the Word of the Lord, and he was compelled to tell the truth. Put up that White House picture for me. This happened in 2015. What this world honors is detestable in the sight of God. Luke 16, 15. Godliness makes a nation great, but sin is a disgrace to any people. I want to tell you that I've been blessed to be raised around many different cultures and many people. Even my God family is an African-American family, and we were raised together. My brother, Sabor, Shakur, my aunt, Sakina. And I've gone to, I went to a graduation, many African graduations, and it's funny. Like, in the African cultures, you have many aunts and uncles, and they're not really your aunt and uncle, are they? I'm African like that. I get that. I got lots of aunts and uncles, aunties, Akina, Uncle Melvin. That's my family. We were raised together. We love each other. And I want to say that being close to all those cultures has been such a blessing to me. And growing in this church has been such a blessing. I love it. Through every tribe and every tongue, he's represented. He's not a white Jesus or a black Jesus. If he's anything, he's Jewish. (laughs) He's brown. (laughs) And he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But I want to tell you something that broke my heart today. I knew a group of people who looked different than me. And when this president was elected, they celebrated. And I understand why. Because it was a great step forward for our nation as a whole. That's amazing. It was worth celebrating. I'm glad that there was celebration. But then when this happened, there was silence by the same people who celebrated. Can I tell you that silence is perceived as consent? And that's called confusion. When the world looks on at this and the same Christians who celebrated were silent, that produces confusion. The floodgates have opened in our nation since then. You know, that was four years ago, and back then it wasn't on the table that kids didn't know their gender, that there were drag queens. Now you see pedophilia in the news because foggy in the church is darkness in the world. And because many people were silent at this and didn't call it what it was because political alignment, darkness has filled our nation. Micaiah didn't come in aligning himself politically to anybody. He came representing the king, speaking the truth. I'm telling you that this is wrong and it is sin. And because it was exalted in our nations, we are reaping the benefits and our children are under the deception now. It's not okay. The church needs to rise and speak the truth. And because the church has not stood in the council, the world is filled with confusion. I want to tell you the end of Micaiah's story as we close. There's a scripture that says, is there not one prophet? Is there not one prophet in the land? One prophet. You know, after he spoke that word, the next day Ahab went into that battle. Ignoring him. That dude's crazy. I got my 400, I got the other king, I got all these people around me, I'm good. You want to know what he did? He hid himself in normal clothes because normally a king can be very clearly seen in battle. They sit up on the chariots and everything. You want to know? He got just like a foot soldier. And it says that all the battle raged and they looked for King Ahab to kill him. 
They were searching for him to kill him. And they couldn't find him because he was in the soldier's clothes. And it goes on to say that it's almost like he was leaving the battlefield. And he was going to get away scot-free until a random man stood up and shot a random arrow into the air. One arrow flew through the air and skipped all the thousands upon thousands of people and found King Ahab right in the vulnerable part of his clothing. It says he was covered from head to foot except for his side. His arm moved and the arrow went straight through his side and he bled out and died on that field because of the word of the Lord is fulfilled. It will not return to him void. And if God has said it, it will happen. I might have upset some people today, but that's okay because I'm not looking for a whole multitude today. God doesn't need a multitude. He doesn't need an army. He doesn't need a mob. He doesn't need kings. And he doesn't need popular vote. He needs one Micaiah. One. One person. And I ask today, are you willing to settle it? that God's word is true? Are you willing to love it and rid this world of the delusion? And are you willing to speak it and disavow yourself from any allegiances politically that would keep you from speaking God's truth? Be God's mouthpiece today. Decide that I'm going to speak the truth because I care enough about people to speak the truth that will set them free. Will you stand with me? We stand before God in this moment right now. I want to ask you, if you're willing to settle it in your heart, that God's word is true and let men be lies, that you say, God, I would desire truth in my inward parts. I want to love truth, God. And I want to speak the truth when it's necessary so that people can be set free, so that confusion can be lifted from the land. If you say, I want to be a, Kam- a Micaiah today, I want you to lift your hand before the Lord. Lift it high. Lift it high before the Lord. Now put both hands up before the Lord. Father God, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, God, for setting apart a people in this room right now. These hands that are lifted, God, let your anointing come on them now, God. An anointing that is no longer afraid of popular opinion. It is no longer afraid of politics. It's no longer afraid of what men call important, Lord, but they sit in your counsel, God. I pray that they would hear your voice, God, and that it would break through the noise, that they would know clearly that homosexuality is sin and it sends people out of the kingdom, God. That they would know clearly that abortion is murder, God. And that they would not play politics, God. And that they would not align themselves with these politics that keep them silent in the face of evil. God, we commit today to speak the truth. Say, Father God, I commit to speak your word even if it gets me in trouble. Because I know it will set the captive free. And you will confirm your word. In Jesus' mighty name, give God a praise in this place.